Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I am here at the India Today BT studio at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And with me, a panel of very eminent Indian business people and industrialist Ajit Gulabchand, the veteran of Davos, his 32nd year here. Uh, and the CMD of HCC, Suman Sina, Chairman and CEO of Renew Power, and Dr. Arnaba Ghosh, uh, the CEO of Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Thank you very much. Um, so, Gulabchand, uh, we start with you. Uh, another uh, forum, this one just nine months after the one last summer. Uh, there's a lot of snow behind us. Uh, apart from the weather, what else has changed this time at Davos? Well. There's a little more clarity on the confusion that existed in May. Okay. And it is more confused. In the sense that the, the uncertainties of that time have not gone. COVID, though seems to have subsided considerably. The recent events in China say that we are still around and we don't know what will happen. The war has dragged on, leaving more uncertainties in the wake of supply chains. The inflation continues to bog the Western world, as well as measures of inflation also have a tendency to have a troublesome effect on decision making. So, as you read today in the newspapers, or the write downs that most of the companies have had to do. So, all in all, the atmosphere is of uncertainty and elements of fear, which is making people take decisions to prevent themselves from going under. So you don't see now a great enthusiasm for, for new investment because new investment calls for a yes. And now it is yes, no of course, but this is well, let's wait. Okay. Uh, Suman, this new uh, 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 lack of enthusiasm as uh, Ajit uh, Gulabchand puts it for new investment, is that something applicable to India as well? Because we've been hearing other people and say, they're saying India is gung-ho. Yes, Siddharth, look, I think that uh, on the point that, uh, that Ajit was talking about, I think last year there was confusion. Nobody knew which way things are going to shape out. Now I think people know how things are going to shape out. We've had the whole Federal Reserve increase of interest rates over the course of last year. But now the end in some ways is beginning to become visible. And the end destination as to how it might shape up is also becoming a little bit visible. And the general sense is that China is now going through the COVID situation. A few months later, they'll be through it. Um, interest rates will stop increasing and then start going down by the end of the year. So I think all of that is causing some room for optimism as well. But to answer your question, India certainly is on an upswing as far as uh, a lot of sectors are concerned. Uh, I, I don't know about the real estate sector or the infrastructure sector. Of course, Ajit can speak to that. Yep. But certainly a number of other sectors, there's clearly an upswing that is happening. Uh, corporate capex is picking up. Banks are have cleaned up their balance sheets, uh, corporates have delivered to a large extent, domestic demand seems to be reasonably decent so far and so therefore it does look like the economy is poised for a few years of reasonably decent growth. But it's not just India, I think if you look at our sector in general which is a renewable sector, clearly globally there is a lot of investment going into this sector. So I would say that uh, uh, there are, I think it's sector specific to some extent. Uh, certainly, India, I think, is reasonably. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up that theme about uh, the renewable power sector. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, we've seen an unprecedented crisis like Joshi Mutt. We've seen other weather related, environment related uh, impacts in India. And why I'm bringing that right up mm. is even as uh, companies chase profits and uh, people chase economic growth, the environment is increasingly becoming clearer to the average Indian is a very important point. Uh, how severe is this uh, crisis and do you see we being prepared for it? So Siddharth, uh, the, uh, you know, the climate crisis is here and now. Uh, we at CW have mapped out all the districts in India and we can say that 75% of India's districts now are hot spots for extreme climate events. 75% 75 of all our of, districts? Yeah. So this is, an, you know, of course it's a global crisis but countries like India become more vulnerable. And therefore, the development pathway we de design has to be completely different from anyone else because the advanced economies of today have already built out that infrastructure and created the global problem in the, in the first place. Built out infrastructure <coughs> in what was essentially, in a, what was essentially a skiing village. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 this does not mean that you, you know, development has to stop. The question is, firstly, what is the pattern of economic growth you want in different parts of the country? Um, 
in particularly vulnerable regions, etc., you might want to have a different kind of economic development uh, versus in the plains, etc., where you can build out the harder infrastructure. But secondly, if you can start mapping out these climate risks properly at a hyper-local level, then you can price it in into your insurance uh, for well, that I'm infrastructure. I'm going to interrupt you here and uh, take this example of water, for example. Mm. Uh, there are many, many companies now, and mm. uh, uh, there were pioneers in this segment, who made profits out of bottled water. Mm. The lack of clean water, mm. and they made. What should business therefore be doing with this crisis mm. that you are saying? 75% fall districts, uh, uh, climate hotspots. I think that's a very scary number. What is the challenge for Indian business now? The most important challenge is how do you get jobs, growth and sustainability aligned in your business plan? Yes. These are no longer separate issues as an afterthought. You know? So renewable energy makes this sense in any case. It's not about window some... dressing. It's not after the you know, bottom line, you know, some CSR activity. You have to put sustainability into your business plan because if you are an export-oriented industry, for instance, your global market standards are already changing. He's built uh, a completely sustainable business uh, exactly. from scratch, really. Yeah. So whether it's in automobiles, whether it is, I mean, renewable energy in any case, but, you know, you, uh, if we have to export cars to Europe in 15 years from now, we can't export diesel or elect, uh, petrol cars. We'll have to export electric cars. If but, you're making steel, you have to make it green steel. You know, I have two things to just say here. One is, I've, I've worked a lot with water. I was part of the water movement, I was one of the first CEOs to be part of the United Nations CEO mandate, water mandate. And we found that there's a big danger in India because it's, except for the Brahmaputra basin, lots of basins have started drying out. And the reason is that we have used water very badly. We again, every time we talk about water, we discuss drinking water, mm -hmm. we discuss these little things. But that's not how water is used. 75% of the water is used for agriculture. Yes. Another 20%, 25% is used for industrial goods. And only about 5% is used for sanitation and drinking. Mm -hmm. So when you get such a low, I'm not saying we should not focus on drinking water, but if you can reduce the, the, the consumption of water, which Israel has done. Israel uses one-sixth the water that America... Do you see India, that happening? We couldn't even get the farm um, laws implemented. American, we have... American and Indian consumption of agriculture. If you can make it one-sixth, you can recycle industrial use water as well as our... Uh, uh, for drinking. And I think that is the good news in it. That while the water is depleting, it can be... Replenished. We have options. Uh, you know, we have models There before. is a clear understanding now scientifically proved that the water is the same in the world since it began. <laughs> Absolutely. Shumant, uh, the, the point about uh, uh, you, you, you building a business, business that is actually sustainable by uh, its very nature, by its fundamental foundations, yet uh, uh, we've seen in the recent past what has happened to power purchase agreements. I'm not referring to one p particular case. Is the government serious about sustainable industries, sustainable businesses uh, like yours in India? Look, I think the government has been really uh, quite pioneering in the approach it's taken mm. to encourage and to convert India into a green economy in terms of both setting targets within India itself uh, as far as the energy transition is concerned, now coming out of the national green hydrogen mission um, and then also, of course, trying to make India an export hub for green technologies and so on. So the g central government, I would say, is doing that bit. I think where we have a problem or we need more work is at the state level. The states really need to also come to the party and really put sustainability much more strongly at their core. Which is why 18 rupees per unit has become two and a half? Absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's exactly uh, no, the please. reason. I think people have been investing and scale has been going up and those kinds of things. but. To your point um, of uh, contracts and so on, again, those are the state level. So states have to, as I said, come to the party. And I think beyond that, corporates have to take sustainability much more, as uh, Nava was saying, much more into their own core operations and their thought process. And that's beginning to happen. I can see the early stages of that happening because we now begin to sell a lot more clean electricity mm -hmm. to corporates. That's becoming a bigger and bigger opportunity. But I think there's a long way still to go. I, I have a quick yeah. follow-up. Yeah. Just for the average viewer, till some years back we used to hear a lot about carbon credits. You're not hearing that much. Why is that? What What am I missing or is it just no, ignorance on no, my behalf? I, I think the thing is that carbon credits were used as a way to 
encourage uh, certain technologies, for example, renewable energy. So in the beginning, there was a lot of um, carbon credits sort of linked to renewable energy. Now renewable energy has become commercially viable on its own, and therefore you don't have carbon credits being associated with renewable energy projects. But and also the whole Kyoto Protocol, which is sort of the framework under which carbon credits were set up, uh, that has sort of uh, now lapsed, and nothing has taken its place, unfortunately. So in some ways, the carbon market is now, and of course, Arnav can talk to this much more in detail. Uh, the reality is, it's much more become a voluntary market, yes. and we're moving away from from avoidance based, which is really what clean energy does, to much more removal based carbon credits. And so that's, I think, a market that is going to. And under the Paris Agreement, we have what is called Article 6.2, which will be bilateral trading of of credits, and Article 6.4 will replace the CDM, will be the global market. That has yet to come through, but the Energy Conservation Amendment Bill that passed through Parliament last month has already announced that there a new carbon market will be designed in India. So I think it's important also not just to look at international carbon credits, but get the lowest cost projects done for making our industries more sustainable, more. Doctor Kush, explain to our viewers uh, in the context of. Uh, the whole thing about uh, the cost of mitigation. If mm. Indian industry uh, has to move and become more sort of uh, towards a net zero kind of, uh, there was a lot of money that was required. A hundred billion figure was put up many years back. Nothing is happening. Why should India alone bear the burden of what the developed world has enjoyed for decades, really? For the I'll come to you on that. I know you're shaking your head. I'll for, come to you. For, for the reasons I outlined earlier, India is a vulnerable country, but it also has to drive investments towards the economy of the future. And the economy of the future is a green one. Now, where's the money going to come from? Our estimation for net zero for renewables, for electric mobility, and for green hydrogen is $10.1 trillion of investment in 2020 prices. Now, th that $100 billion is a drop in the bucket. So what we need to be thinking about is really how do you crowd in large volumes of institutional capital from within the country and from outside the country at lower costs of finance. And that can only, I mean, of course, companies like Sumans, you know, which have best performing metrics, etc., are able to attract. But there are thousands more companies that will require that investment. And in order to do that, we need policy clarity. We need state level action. But we also need reforms at the multilateral financial institutions to leverage their balance sheets to crowd in private capital. Another gathering at Davos, do you see anything happening on that count? Well, after the Paris talk failed, when Trump pulled out, and the rest of the world got together and said, we'll do it, none of that money came from the rest of the world. And so it became flat to some extent. The discussion has been launched again, but the war had created some differences. So I think it will take another year or two for these things to be sorted out. But coming back to your point on should India be paying the bill, see, India has to look after its own children. Our own sustainability for our own sake and our children's sake has to be there. So, so should so sustainability if, be put before growth, before no, no, basic no, no, growth, no, no, before no, feeding nobody, people, no, no, getting no, 400 no, million no, people out of poverty? No, no. It's not as black and white as that. As he said very clearly, you have to have a balance between sustainability, growth, and jobs. And jobs. Uh, and if I can also add to that, see, it's, I think you have to look at the cost of not going after sustainability exactly. as well, right? Mm -hmm. And compare yeah. the cost of sustainability with the cost of not going after sustainability. Yeah. You find that... An example for people to understand, yeah. if you can yeah. just rattle it off. Garbage also, dumps in Delhi. Yeah, look, at, look at the fact garbage that dumps. there's such a huge amount of pollution, right? Yeah. And the kind of healthcare costs and the quality of life uh, deterioration that all of us suffer as a result of that. And those are simple examples Water levels of dropping the fact yeah, that, that we need to do a lot more. Extreme uh, weather events this, cost yeah, us yeah. between 5 to $6 billion of losses on an annual basis. We've and lost $80 billion dollars just in the last two decades. And, and then, you know, industries will not be able to export if you don't uh, become exactly. sustainable. Yes. Or the market standards are changing. Right? And standards so, therefore, we'll be left as an outlier in the rest of the world. So, to me, therefore, there is no contradiction between going green and becoming sustainable and economic development. And, this is the and being a technological leader. A similar thing was done by Prime Minister Modi when he was Chief Minister. People were using child labor in their district. And he was on a campaign to say you shouldn't do it. Then he finally said to them, if nobody tomorrow buys your goods, don't come crying to me. Okay. As we wind down this conversation, I have just one topic to uh, take with you. And Mr. Gulabchand, I start with you again. You build Lawasa, a city in the hills. I have been there once. Fantastic place. There's Joshi Mutt. 
uh, which people are saying is not sustainable. Somebody is blaming a power project. Somebody is saying, no, it's because of some other reasons, over construction. We have seen what has happened to our hill station. You're also a builder. You've also done lots of fantastic infrastructure projects. Is there a lesson from Joshi much that you would like to share? See, for let us understand first thing. This every time trying to dump it only on the infrastructure that this is the reason why all bad things happen is not correct. There is a lot of studies to be done. Like for example, as they have known that this particular landmass on which Jyoti Mart is based is basically a, 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 a landslide uh, foundation. So as a result, it is prone to getting cracks any time. So it's wrong to blame a particular power project. It is one project. This is not the case. Have you seen? Or the road that have is you being seen built. Have you seen today? The sprawl. It is as big as gym, Simla almost, compared to a small village that it used to be on the way to your pilgrimages. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, he wants to no, so my my only simple metric is any region has a carrying capacity. Okay. Uh, you can take uh, water. Fall. Land, waste, you know, whether you're on the plains, whether you're on the hills, define the carrying capacity of a region, price in the externalities, and then if you are able to pay, you are able to live there. If you're not able to pay, you have to limit the number of people who come in, limit the number of projects that come up, and that's what I will... The final word with Suman on the Look, I think one other issue, and I agree with everything they've said, is the issue of biodiversity. Yeah. That's an area that yeah. we really haven't paid enough attention to. And I think if you look at the fact that human population in the last, you know, maybe 30, 40 years has doubled and all, all sort of non-human population has gone down by 70%, it's hard to fathom those numbers. And I think we have to be a lot more careful about just not just looking at clean energy and carbon emissions, but look at it much more broadly. Mm -hmm. And that in some ways gets us back to the yeah. Prime Minister's concept of life and so on, which is I think that lifestyles have to become much more sustainable. Lifestyles have to become much more sustainable and I wish viewers I could show you right where we are, just uh, uh, 10 meters away, a solar panel setup for power. Of course, they are covered with snow during the winter, <laughs> but if a skiing resort can have space and utilize solar panels, I think it's something that all of India needs to do along with so much uh, else that needs to be done. Suman Sina, Ajit Gulabchan and Dr. Gorsh, thank you very much thank for your time you. with that. It's a wrap on this particular broadcast Jiu from Jiu the World Economic Forum and Davos. We'll be back with more. Do stay tuned in. Until we meet again, goodbye. Mm -hmm.